Welcome to the Swisspreneur Show, a podcast about startup stories and hands-on learnings from experienced entrepreneurs. My name is Sylvan, and I will be your host. So where are we today? Well, you guessed it, back in Zurich. But we're about to enter one of the most prominent locations in our city, the Prime Tower, one of Switzerland's rare skyscrapers. We'll be meeting with entrepreneur and politician Andre Silberschmidt to talk about how to start a company in Zurich, as well as the current political climate for startups. We entered the Prime Tower building and signing at the lobby to receive our visitor badge, after which we pass the security gate and wait for the automatic elevators. These elevators are ordered based on the floor you have to go to, so there's no button to push. You just enter the right elevator and it takes you right where you want to go. After a short ride, we arrive at the beautiful offices of ZKB. Andre appears shortly thereafter and greets us with a warm smile and a firm handshake. He's in his busy period. Political elections are due in about a month and he has many events and discussions to attend, besides being also incredibly active on social media. I asked him if he still gets enough sleep with all these duties on his agenda and he tells me that, despite it all, he still manages to get at least seven hours each night in order to function well. Which is pretty smart and impressive, in my opinion. After this short walk, we arrive at the conference room and start the interview right away. Before we get started with the episode, I would like to introduce you to SBB Startup. If you think that your company is a good fit for the Swiss Railways, get in touch with them or learn more about their startup programs at spbstartup.com. Andre, a very warm well welcome to the Swisspreneur Show. It's great to have you here today for this Q&A session. And we're going to start with the first topic focus of starting a company in Zurich, just as you did with your company, with Kaizen. And the first question comes from Cedric Waldburg. There are a few of him. And he says, where do I find some good template docs to set up my company in Zurich? So you can Google for it and you find some different websites, gründen.ch. Mm -hmm. uh, you find also a website of the government where they try to help you to found a company. So that's what I did when we started two years ago with the uh, GmbH. So I was just looking up for some help and to be honest, in the end, it's the best way is to just ask a friend who already did it because I think it's much easier uh, instead of just reading all these papers and what you should do and what you shouldn't do. So best way is just ask someone who already founded the company. I think that's the easiest way. And if you don't know someone, you can reach out to me. So <laughs> Awesome. So we'll tell your contact details yeah. or social media handles at the end of this episode. And then also a question that you probably also faced with your business is how do I hire someone in Zurich? Because there are some legal and practical aspects that you have to consider there. Yeah, so first it's important that the person has a work permit. It's uh, easier to get a permit. I mean, when you're from Switzerland and when you're Swiss, you are able to work. Uh, when you're from the European Union, a, a country from the European Union, um, you're allowed to work normally in Switzerland. Uh, it's harder when you want to hire someone who is from a... Um, stayed outside of the European Union. So right. we have a quota system. So you have to ask the canton if there is a free quota of this country to, to hire um, this person. Mm -hmm. So this is the first thing you have to consider. And if the person has a work permit, it's really easy. Um, you just have to do it according to the law. And I think Switzerland has a, has a great law when it comes to hiring and also firing it's not like in the us uh, you have more job security than in the us but mm -hmm. still there is a lot of flexibility compared to uh, france or germany absolutely and i think this is a very startup friendly thing because things change there and you also need to be uh, stay a bit flexible in that regard right yeah yeah that's true that's true but i think there are there are still some uh, improvements to be done mm -hmm. so um, you, you always have to report like how much you work and when you go to work. So there are some restrictions, right. but the restrictions are not when you want to hire someone, you're quite free. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, you also have to consider the salary you pay uh, in some um, branches, like in, in uh, restaurants where I'm um, with my startup, you have some minimum salaries. So this is something you have to consider as well. Right, good point to mention. How do people find out whether 
there are like minimum salaries that they have to pay? Do they also find that on the web or where did you inform yourself about that topic? I suggest to join an as association. Mm -hmm. um, so the association for the restaurants is Kostro Swiss. So they, they help you with everything. So they have all the know-how. So you don't have, I think, yeah, it's, you will never know everything. Mm -hmm. So better go to an association that, that um, takes care of your sector and they can help you. That makes a lot of sense. Good recommendation. And then what's, from your perspective, the most successful startup that has ever been started in Zurich? Uh, I don't know if you if you can say that objectively. There is um, the top 100 startup event of Venture Lab, and last year Ava was um, regarded as one of the most successful startup in uh, out of Zurich. Mm -hmm. uh, we have another one that is uh, the Get Your Guide, right? That is, the uh, unicorn. The unicorn <laughs> now. So uh, I think there are good examples of out of Zurich where startups were founded and and now. Um, expanding to to all over the world. So, um, but it's hard to say it objectively. But what is uh, really successful and what not? Is it just the valuation, or is it uh, like the technology behind? Or yeah, many different aspects or perspectives. But it's great to see that there are at least some role models to motivate more people. Yeah, and it's really important to see that because Switzerland is a really small market. So at some point, when you start a business, you have to go. Uh, like to, to European countries or to the US. And I think it's it's harder to innovate out of a smaller country than from, from a big country like the US where the market is, is much bigger. So it's, it's good to see that it's still possible. And I think, yeah, we have, we have not a bad framework here in Switzerland to, to start a business, but we need to improve when it comes to, to grow the business, um, to have more role models uh, like Ava or Get Your Guy. That's a very good spirit. What are some mistakes that I should avoid when I start a company in Zurich? Probably you can also share some of your experience if there have been any. What we did right probably is that we didn't start with a business case and with a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So um, we start with effectuation. So we just like tried out things. We had a pop-up, but we had no money at all. So we had to grow with the revenue of our clients. So I think a big mistake could be if you think you have the greatest idea ever mm -hmm. and, and and like hire some people and get a lot of money and then you realize after some months that it was not the greatest idea ever. So probably I would say just start slow but mm -hmm. grow fast. So when you start, try to really understand what your product is and what your USP is. And mm -hmm. if you think you, you know it, and you have kind of the proof of concept, then you, you really need to uh, be fast. But I would say in the first weeks or months, just be a bit cautious and and not spend all the the money you, you already have or, or, or uh, hired so many people and then you have so many obligations. So and when it comes to obligations, I also recommend to just um, have like short term contracts, not just mm -hmm. with the people you hire, but also uh, when it comes to rent or with the insurance, that's something also we did wrong. We just like signed all the insurance documents and then we realized we had like three or five years contract. And well, um, yeah. the conditions are really bad when you're a startup because you're not profitable for, for the counterparty. So, um, and then you grow and grow and have new, more revenue. So you get better conditions. So it's better to have like short term contracts um, to renew it after a year or two. So this is something we learned. I think that's also a very good tip. Are there any recommendations how you can actually execute that? Because as you said, insurance companies, for example, but usually also office leases um, for B2B uh, businesses, they are always more uh, long-term oriented than short-term. So how can you get that contract negotiated to a short-term agreement? I think it's, it depends on the business climate. So at the moment we have many free spaces when it comes to office space. So the people, they are just looking for you and, and they, they are happy if, if you cover their cost. So um, I think it's easier to, to have a rent, a short term rent now than like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to insurance, they have the standard contracts and they uh, last longer because it's obviously better for them. But um, I think you just have to talk to them and, and yeah, or have a friend who is working in this industry and, and asking, asking them, yeah. And then one important aspect also of starting a company and probably also hiring the right people is the living cost of a city that you are operating in. So 
what are the living costs in Zurich from your perspective that are like realistic assumptions for entrepreneurs? So I, I was checking that question of um, on, on the website of ETH. So they were calculating those figures and they said it's roughly around 2,000, 2,500 francs for um, living food, TV and, and stuff like this. So I think living cost is, is, is not low. But um, you find also around Zurich, not not in within Zurich, but you find cheaper places to live, and so it's it's doable. It's not like I would say when you go to New York or so. It's you get not a much life quality for a high price, and yeah. in Switzerland the prices are are not low, but the life quality is like awesome. So I think there are many reasons to pay those prices because you get something back. Mm -hmm. So as I said, like two to two point five thousand a month. Um, but most of the time, when you start working for for also for startups, you earn at least four thousand. I would say four point five. So it's it's manageable. It's uh, you. I mean, you don't get rich when you earn just four four thousand, but you can start something and and right. then hopefully grow and and yeah earn more. I think this is a, a very important message. You know that. You know, Switzerland is expensive, but has a good quality. But at the same time, it's also affordable. So you don't need to earn 10K a month um, to be able to survive yes. here in Syria. Yes, absolutely. When you are aware of the living costs, um, you might also think about finding your co-founders. Um, where do you, do you find them in Zurich? What would be a, a good process or a good place to find your co-founders? So I would say Zurich or the Swiss people in general, they, they like to be within networks. So when someone from abroad came to Zurich mm -hmm. and she was telling me at Christmas, she thought nothing is going on in Zurich because no one was on the street. And she was like, what the hell? And then she realized that everyone is just within its own uh, network celebrating Christmas. And if you don't belong to a network, you're, you just think it's nothing is happening, right? right. So I think that you should realize that when you want to start your own business that you have to go to those networks and mm -hmm. uh, there are so many startup associations startup events and just go there mm -hmm. and talk to the people it's 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 said really easily but um like a lot of people still go on linkedin and write also to me and and i think why why don't you come to those events and talk to me because those uh, like LinkedIn pitches, I think they are not so successful. I don't know, perhaps they are be because people are still doing it. But um, for me, it's like it's not a personal way. And so the Swiss people in general, they like to talk to each other, to look into each other's eyes. Um, and there are, I would say on every evening, there is a possibility to be in a network. Mm -hmm. And they are not exclusive, So, but they don't ask for you to join. So you really sure. have to go there and you will definitely find your co-founder there. So you have to take the initiative, yes. which is also a very entrepreneurial thing. So that's yes. a good uh, sort of uh, entry gate. Yeah, the opportunity that doesn't wait for you. You have to look after it. Absolutely. Are there any particular events that you would recommend uh, to network in Zurich? I mean, there are lots of. So coming from politics, we have like a, on a daily basis uh, events. And what I, th I think are the most um, inspiring events or the, the events where you meet the uh, most inspiring people are those which have not a, like a real cause to really meet someone. Like, mm -hmm. So sometimes you meet the most interesting people where you don't expect it to meet them. So I recommend to go to events where you're really interested in and mm -hmm. where you think it's, that that's an area where you want to know more and not, not like... Hey, here is a startup event and you can find your co-founder here. I think it's kind of the, yeah, I don't know if that really uh, gives the right matches. So um, you can also go to a sport um, uh, event or uh, public training and stuff like this. I think I, in these occasions you really meet people with similar interests but different backgrounds. And that's something you need when you want to have a co-founder. You, you don't want to have like the, the people who are walking around just with the business cards and, and like I think that's not um, a good start for a new business. Yeah, that's right. So you cannot force it. It just happens yeah. naturally, but you need to get yourself out there to yeah. network. Yeah. And then once you found your co-founder or co-founders, um, sooner or later, you probably also need some office space. 
where would you look for office space in Zurich that is affordable, but also good for startups? So we have a growing network of co-working spaces here in Zurich. There is the, the Impact Hub, for example. Um, we have also possibilities to um, rent for temporary usage, like um, Novak Solutions is a company, a startup founded by a friend of mine, cool. to be transparent. Um, there is another one, Project Interim, mm -hmm. and they offer you for low cost offices um, in the center of Zurich. So if there is, at the moment, there is a, a big market for, for cheap um, office space because, uh, as I mentioned before, there, isn't, there is not enough demand. Um, mm -hmm. I also handed in a motion in the parliament of the city of Zurich to make it easier. Uh, to to use um, empty space for different usages because at the moment when you had a, co a coffee shop before uh, you cannot just um, do an office there you have to have a new permit so I want to make it easier or to have one room with different types of usage mm -hmm. um, so this is um, it passed through the parliament fortunately so uh, it's going to mm -hmm. happen that it's uh, going to be much easier to use a, a big room for different reasons and not just for for one company. Yeah. And we also talked about the duration of the contract. So how long does such an office lease typically endure? What's the typical duration of such a contract? So when you work with those um, companies that do temporary usage, it's mm -hmm. normally it's on a monthly basis. You can um, rent it or also end the, the rent. I mean, for sure, when you, um, when you rent for, um, like, like we, um, without an end date, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's longer. But we have um, three restaurants in Zurich and one in Basel, and all of them we can just go after three months. So it's kind of, it's not, it's not like the contract five years or 10 yeah. years contract anymore. I think that's something we had in the past, and mm -hmm. it's no one is, is doing this kind of contracts anymore. I mean, not the startups. And as long as the big uh, corporations don't need that much space anymore, um, there is place for us startups to, to um, get the better conditions. Which is a fantastic thing to happen because yes. then there will hopefully be more startups in Switzerland. Yes. Who are, from your perspective, the best investors and angels that can help you once you actually are looking for money? You know, after you found this initial product market fit, you found your product and solution, now you, you are looking for some money. But what's the best address to go to there? So we didn't uh, look for an investor so far. Uh, we are 100% organic finance at the moment. We want to raise some money probably this year because mm -hmm. um, we need to expand our business or we want to expand it. Um, at the moment, we just think about getting some uh, credit. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want to dilute our shares at this moment. And as we are already profitable, I think it's easy to get a good credit. Um, but when you look for an equity investor, I think you have to ask yourself several questions like, do you need smart money or do you want smart money? Do you want someone who brings some knowledge or do you just want to have like um, the network of, of this investor or you just want to have the money and nothing else and you, you better know what to do and right. don't, don't need um, the advice of the investor. So there are several questions you have to ask yourself and I recommend also to um, talk to some VCs or, or friends working for VCs when it comes to the real contract. I think mm -hmm. there are many things you can do wrong when you set up those investment contracts. So uh, you better ask for advice or, or have a, a legal advisor. So mm -hmm. um, in our board, we have an, an independent legal advisor to help us out with, with those questions because I think you can uh, ruin your whole business when you set it up the wrong way. That's something you have to consider. I think this is also an interesting point, you know, getting advisors on board or supporters. How do you work with them? Do you like pay them a regular salary? Do you pay them on an hourly basis? Do they have shares of your company? What is the best practice from your experience, how you can get advisors on board and also pay them for their services? So I was lucky because of my engagement in politics that I know a lot of people. So when I reached out in the beginning of this year uh, to some uh, colleagues, if they want to join the advisory board, they mm -hmm. they said yes because they <laughs> were like, oh, it's Pokeball, and, and you were asking, so why not? Sure. And at the moment, they were not asking for any money because I think like we have uh, three people in our advisory board, 
-hmm. And like one is Alan Frey from Amorana. Then we have uh, Peter Herzog. Um, he's a big guy in, in the restaurant business. And then we have Kaspar Wenger. He's the chairman of Holzim. So we were looking for different types, like Alan with the startup background, mm -hmm. Peter with the restaurant background, and Cosper with the business background. And I mean, two out of three of them are for sure over 40. So I realized that they just want to give back to the young generation. So mm -hmm. this is kind of the salary they get is that they can be really close to a startup, close to young people who want to change something in their sector they are interacting in. Mm -hmm. So I think this, yeah, you just have to reach out to the, those people because some of them, they don't have to work like 50 hours on a weekly basis anymore. So they have more free time, but they still want to do something um, usable. Uh, and so that that's why I, I, I think most of them, they don't ask for money. They just, they want to see you perform. They want to see you running. So. Yeah. Um, if you don't do that, I think they will ask for money because they think it's not worth it to give an advice if you don't execute or if you don't, I mean, you don't have to just take the advice and execute it, but, but sure. debate about it and then mm -hmm. um, have a result out of this debate. So I think as long as they see a process and mm -hmm. that we really care about what they are saying, um, they do it for free. Nice. Then the next question comes from, from Bjorn F. He asked, why should I actually start my startup company in Zurich? What do you think? Why is Zurich a good place to start? Because this network aspect that you just mentioned, that could be one of the many reasons why Zurich is a good place. Yeah, there are many good reasons. So the life quality is brilliant here. Um, you have a really good ecosystem also of big corporations. So there is a lot of money. You have the pension funds uh, sitting on like 800 billion francs just waiting to invest in startups. You have um, universities like the ETH and University of Zurich. Mm -hmm. You have universities of applied science. They're getting more and more importance as well. Um, you have the lake, you have the street parade, you have Google with 2,000 employees. So it's kind of, um, there's, I would say there's n there are not many places that are better to start a business than in Zurich. For sure, we need to uh, do our homework and we need to improve some things in politics. We're going to speak mm -hmm. about that later, but um, just the environment is just awesome, I would say. Mm -hmm. And the city of Zurich, are there also any, you know, governmental funded or startup supporting projects that you could recommend? So the politics in Switzerland is usually not in favor of subsidy mm -hmm. and um, so the government is not in favor of like startups or, or specific sectors. So normally they're like sector neutral policies mm -hmm. and also startup neutral policies, because I understand also the big corporations saying that it cannot be that the startups always get an exemption of the law and we have to follow every rule. Yeah. So this is why the, the city, the canton um, and the, uh, the country of Switzerland, they try to be like neutral and don't subsidize mm -hmm. uh, different specific sectors, but for sure they try to have some um, initiatives they support. Like we have uh, Venture Lab, uh, we have Kickstart Accelerator, we have uh, Digital Switzerland uh, that initiated that accelerator. So we have so many public private partnerships helping uh, the startup ecosystem to, to um, get more and more attraction. So this is something the, the government is engaging, that just to make a, a good environment for startups, but not to specifically give you as a startup like grants or, or just money to, to start your business. Right. This is something you have to do in the private market. Which I think is also, just from my personal perspective, a smart way, because that way you also have to sort of prove your business first and survive the market conditions. Otherwise, there might be a problem that you face if you get subsidized, for example, you work on the project and then 10 years later, even three years later, you realize, oh, it was actually way off the market and it didn't serve any need, right? Exactly. And the, only the future knows which technology and which products will survive. So if the government starts to um, have a bet on specific technologies. It's for sure not going to be 100% uh, right. And I think it's a um, the task of the government to to do like venture capital. So it, the yeah. government is here for a good framework and everything else is done by private investors. 
You also mentioned the good universities here in Zurich. Helva Helena asked, is there any good way of how I can collaborate with the universities as a startup company here in Zurich? I, I would just reach out to them. Okay. They uh, reply to every request you, you have. So just ask them. And um, I wasn't in a Zurich university. I was a university for applied science. And then I studied in London at the university. So I, I don't know them. Uh, from inside, but um, sure. I know them from politics. So if you have a request, you just reach out to them, and they for sure have a, a lab and or 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 already some startups that um, were started in those universities that, that can work and help you. So um, just reach out, really. I mean, especially ETH, they have a very nice track record of great startups yes. coming out of there. Before we continue with the show, we would like to tell you about Swissnext San Francisco, the launchpad for Swiss startups in Silicon Valley. Their equity-free startup programs are customized to the needs of entrepreneurs exploring or entering the U.S. market. Twice a year, Swissnext brings together Swiss startups for a three-week boot camp with toolbox sessions, special networking events, a demo night, plus much more. Apply by October 30th for the next boot camp that takes place from January 13th to the 24th, 2020 at swissnextsf.org slash startups. Um, the last question for this first topic focus comes from Lucas Schuler and he asks, is Zurich a gender equality promoting area? What do you think about that? I think we're getting more and more on that track. So Switzerland can be seen as a conservative country from abroad. You just know us from the banking um, secret and from cheese and chocolate. And not, not that we are like really progressive country, but Zurich is, stands out from this point of view that um, we are proud of having the pride. We had the uh, 25th anniversary of the Zurich pride this year. Um, and there is more and more um, going on to um, support gender equality, but we are not there where we want to be. The conditions for mothers to go back to work after uh, having a, a baby is, is still not, not where we want to be. Right. But uh, things are improving and the majority in politics, they, they know the issues and they want to improve that. So it changed from 10 years ago where also the city of Zurich, I would say, was... was a, uh, not so progressive as it is today mm -hmm. so um, but to be honest it's it's the progress is good mm -hmm. and gender equality is something I support but um, we also need good economic uh, conditions so we we don't have to lose this focus as well it's important to have the focus on progressive um, liberal politics but also on the, on a good economic conditions mm -hmm. makes sense I think this is a perfect way to transition to the second topic focus, where we want to talk about the political climate for startups in Zurich, but also in Switzerland in, in general. And the first question comes from Larsen, and he asked, why are there so few politicians with, with real startup experience? Like, there are not that many active politicians that have actually real startup experience. What do you think? Why is that the case? So being involved in politics, uh, you know that it's quite a hard job. In Switzerland, we have the tradition of the militia system. So it means that you have a job beside uh, your political work or your parliamentary job. So normally, it's, it's uh, when you start your own company, you have to focus more than 100% just on, on your own startup. And it's really hard to have like um, a parliamentary mandate beside that. So one case could be like Marcel Doppler, the founder of Digitech. He Absolutely. just did his entrepreneurial career, um, exited with Digitech, and then he started his political career. So this is something that is um, more common than what I do and like do everything just beside like the mm -hmm. politics and the startup. And there are less and less people generally in politics with uh, like work experience. The more and more are just focusing and being on 100% politician. So they have their mandates, but besides that, they do PR work or they work for an association, do lobbying. And I don't say that it's right or wrong, it's, it's neutral. Um, but um, people with real hands on working experience are less and less in politics. And the ones who started a company, they are 
they there have never been many of them so i, I would say it's that stable but it's uh, only an exception it's not the the, the rule and if you look at the administrative uh, aspect of doing business in, in Switzerland, there are still many government processes uh, that you still don't have fully digitized. So you still have to file uh, many things on paper to the government to get things done. You need to go to a notary if you want to do a capital increase, for example. Compared to other countries like Estonia, for example, where many, many things are already fully digitized, Switzerland seems to be lacking behind. Do you also see it that way? And yeah. what are the biggest challenges? How can we solve them? So we have the technology here. We have the, the people here. We have the knowledge here. So there is no reason why we cannot do it. So my mission is to have a startup um, founded within one day and to, to make that happen. And I think sometimes in Switzerland we are we, we always say, hey, you know, it takes a bit longer in politics here in Switzerland and it will come uh, for sure soon. And I think we have to change this um, attitude. Mm -hmm. We need to have the attitude also in politics. Now we make it happen. And there is um, no excuse why we cannot do this. I mean, in this case, there is really no excuse because we have the proof in other countries. We have the knowledge and the technology and we have the money here. So why can't we do this within one day? And I think sometimes we really need to have and this courage to say it and also take the risk and just do it and, and not talk about it like for years and years. Um, we fortunately have probably this or next month a um, new law for electronic ID. Mm -hmm. So everyone said in the government, we can only start when we have this new law. So uh, after some point I said, okay, we wait for this new law, but now when we have it, there is really no ex excuse anymore to, to start that. Uh, I think e-government is, is improving in Switzerland, but mm -hmm. from zero. So, I mean, it's, it's easy to improve from this point. Uh, there's still um, a long way to go. What, what do you think is the, the biggest obstacle in that regard that startups face today? And what might be a good quick fix to, to solve that? Maybe there are many. There are, yeah, I think the problem is that you have so many um, different stakeholders involved in the process because we are such a, a federalistic country. So the, the city is involved, the canton is involved, the, the country is involved. Then you have associations um, being a, a food entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to uh, consider different laws on different levels. And everyone has an, another system. And I think this is something which makes it really complicated. And there is no one who, who like looks in a holistic way to, to this uh, framework mm -hmm. and analyzes it and then makes a solution. All, all the stakeholders are just doing it for their own and the systems are not um, working together. And so this is something we need to change. We need to have this holistic view also in politics to uh, from different levels, from the city, from the canton and the country to make this digitization happen. I think that's a, a big problem that you just uh, called out, basically, that we face in Switzerland. From a political perspective, you are also uh, part of the team startup, as you, as you call it, to really support startups. So what do you think on a political level? What can be done uh, to empower more startups in Switzerland? What would be like the specific steps or initiatives that should be launched and go through on a political level? So there are some general issues we face, um, like to, to get people from not from the European Union uh, to Switzerland to have a work permit, the quota system. So the whole migration law needs to be much more startup friendly. Mm -hmm. We have also some um, issues in the tax system or when it comes to um, stock options for uh, em em employers. I, so this, these are things we need to do for every sector. And then I think many challenges are um, specific for, for each sector. So when it comes to um, the financial industry, it was really hard to start as a fintech uh, to get a banking license. So now we have the banking license light and there is some improvement, but we as team startup, so it's Judith Belesh uh, and, and me, we thought we don't know all the challenges um, the startups face in Switzerland. So we just know the challenges we experience or we, re we read about. So that's why we started this team startup to have a platform for all startups to submit the challenge they face on a daily basis. 
I think this is something as a politician you have to do more. Just listen to the people and give them um, a way how they can um, input with, with, their, with their thoughts. Because uh, you don't know everything as a politician. I mean, also as a startup, and as every, no one knows everything. And knowing that you don't know a lot helps you in giving other people a voice. Because we, are, we see each other like, like lobbyists for startups. And that's why we founded this platform, Team Startup, um, to give all the startups a voice and that they can tell us in their specific field um, what they care about. I mean, there are some indexes like the Ease of Doing Business Index, right. uh, where you see the ranks and we are on the rank 38 uh, in the world. And it's like easier to do business in Azerbaijan than in Switzerland. So, mm -hmm. and you, I mean, you see the, the different, um, like, let's say, getting a work permit, having a permit for, um, to build a house, and then you see the ranks. And right. according to that, you can see where we need to improve or where we are already good in it. But this is not really specific. So we still need, as politicians, your advice. And you cannot just look at the ranks and say, oh, we need to change that and that, because that's too obvious. Right. Everyone would would have done this before, so uh, that's why it's really uh, reaching out. It's so mm -hmm. important to the startups. Has there been any any trend that you had identified from the ideas or the problems that the startups handed in over your platform, or anything so, that surprised you in particular? Um, it's it's like it's a really open forum, so you can write whatever you think, and this makes it really interesting. So we we don't have any constraints. So there was one who, who, want, who wants to change the constitution of Switzerland to have like an article to be a, like a really startup friendly nation. Mm -hmm. And then there was uh, one who, who wants to change um, an article in the tax system to make it easier to um, raise capital and stuff like that. So it's the, the range of ideas is so big and this is what we really wanted. Mm -hmm. Um, you don't, it's not a good idea to constrain the thoughts of people from start. So like now right. we just want to have all the ideas and this is what makes it interesting. Because now I, we can think about starting an initiative and collect signatures to have an, um, in our constitution mm -hmm. and startup article. I mean, that would be so amazing, right? Absolutely. Um, but we can also say, no, that's, that's too, uh, too much effort. Um, we, we do something which is easier and have a direct impact. So the variety of ideas is just great. Then if we go a bit more specific into you know, the tax uh, part that you also mentioned already, Brainwash asked, do cantonal taxes form any sort of barrier to actually start a small business here in Switzerland? You mentioned the option pool, for example. What are other barriers that you face when you actually start a company in Switzerland on a tax level? So uh, some years ago, we had a big challenge that um, the valuation of your company uh, was the base of your um, tax you have to pay as an owner of the company. So this was money you have to you were taxed on that is not your liquidity. So at some point you have to sell some parts of your company to just pay the taxes. And this is like crazy. That's crazy. Yeah. But we get rid of that um, in the canton of Zurich. So the tax system is really federalistic. So each Canton has different systems and different levels of, of tax you have to pay. Um, Zurich is not the, the best and uh, has not the best rate, but uh, I think it's not everything's about the tax, right? Um, I think when you start the company, you, that's not your first thought, when, like where to st if you started in Zurich or in Zug because of tax reasons. But when you start operating, you start thinking also about taxes. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, like there is like our um, startup had profits from day one because we were not funded by anyone right. and with that um, system you have to pay taxes also from day one and this is money that goes away you need for new investments and these new investments would lead to better uh, revenue better salaries and new hiring so um, i thought about like having an exception for startups for like two or three years that you don't have to pay these taxes at like not today but perhaps in three years so mm -hmm. you can just hold it back and have this liquidity for for further improvements of your business so this is our ideas i i start thinking now when i see it in our own um, income statement that we always think about now how we can like optimize the 
the income statement that we don't have to give our liquidity away because we really need it for sure. the for the future. Uh, I think you know having both perspectives there, the political perspective but also the startup perspective, is very helpful. But they're also challenging voices. And for example, Helva Helena asked, ethically speaking, can politicians be involved in startups? So can it be a candidate and a business owner? I know this is very much linked to the Swiss system, and you probably have a clear take on this. <laughs> yeah, but but it's a challenge, right? Because when I hand in some motions in the parliament, uh, which which are also in favor of startups, people say, "Oh, you just do it for yourself." And then I say, "No, I just I do it for the ecosystem, and I do it because I learned by myself uh, what it means to do a business, and so I, I see it on a daily basis what we need to change." Mm -hmm. And I think that's a better way than just um, like listening or, or reading about some issues and then trying to change it. But you, if you don't experience, you cannot understand it. Mm -hmm. So, and as long as you're transparent, I think it's okay. As long as the people know the, to which organizations and which companies I belong to, and I'm 100% transparent, People can also read the, the motions I hand in in a different way. So they know, oh, he experienced that in his startup. That's why he proposed it. Mm -hmm. So they can either say, so it's legitimate because he experienced it, or they can say he's just doing it in his favor. But um, you can say this to everyone because the people who work just for an association or, have, I mean, everyone has some interests behind his um, his motions. So... Um, I think there is not, not an issue at all with this, but it's something that people coming from abroad are really asking, like, <laughs> how does it work that, that you're not 100% a politician? But I think the system helps that you are with both feet on the ground, that, that you um, still know what people care about. If you just do politics, you're within your network, close network, political network, and nothing else is, is um, coming from outside. We also talked about the team startup and that this is a sort of a platform where you want to have uh, the connection between the politics and the startups. Are there any other initiatives that you would recommend where startups can get involved to have this sort of bridge between politics and startup business? There are some political startups as well, like uh, Foraus. It's a um, think tank for foreign policy. We have... Uh, Staatslabor, mm -hmm. um, that's like, it's not a think tank, it's, also, it's really a startup to help the government to innovate. So, um, and it was al always one person involved, like Nikola Forster with the startups. Um, yeah. um, but I endorse him a lot, he's not in the same party, but, uh, but he, he's doing great things. So, um, there are startups also in politics, but it's really hard to earn money there because mm -hmm. there is not like a competition and market and, and a lot of demand. No one waits for you. Um, but it's really important for the system to innovate. We have also uh, with Operation Libro, there is, um, um, it's not a party, it's more like a movement of young people to change the, um, also the, the saying about Switzerland to, to have like open-minded, future oriented country and not a backward looking country. Right. So there are some movements and small startups and um, I would just suggest to, to go there and listen or talk to those people. And if you go to the associations, um, like uh, our team uh, is engaging a lot with Gostra Swiss. I mean, they are the people who engage with politics a lot. So if you have something in mind you want to change, you either go to Team Startup um, and hand in your idea or you go to your um, business association and they will help you out. And they also have much more power because they can speak for yes. many, many companies yes. at once, basically. Definitely. Definitely. I think that's a, a good leverage that you can use. Yes, definitely. Now to conclude this episode, there are also some more personal questions. Uh, two more that we have here. So there was just an interest from the audience, basically, what kind of challenges do you face being a young person getting into politics? And are there any parallels to your startup business life that you can see there? Um, good question. So I'm a party member of the Freedom Democratic Party. We are a center-right party. And uh, starting with 17, my political startup, it was a, I founded a chapter, a local chapter of the youth party with 12 members, so really small, 
but this was kind of my first startup. Um, I mean, all the party members, they, they love seeing young people engaging in the party. But um, when it comes to elections, normally the young people, they don't get elected because they were not able to have a good track record. Mm -hmm. And so it's really hard to get in a position where you create a good track record. When you have it, it's much easier. So what I want to say is when you're in politics, when you're young, all people like it because they, they know they need a future in a party. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to specific uh, elections or, or giving you responsibility, they just want to give it to you if you have a track record. So it's really hard to have this jump from like being a rookie to being a young politician who is respected. Mm -hmm. So I was lucky enough to have a, like a career in the youth party, um, being president of the cantonal chapter for three years and now being president of the nation uh, party for almost four years. And having this responsibility, I was able to, to have a proof that what I'm uh, doing is what I'm saying and that I really have like a mission and a vision. And having that, um, people elected me in the local parliament of the city of Zurich, in the municipal parliament. And with this position now, I can build on uh, my track record. So it's not, not an, an, a disadvantage anymore being young in the party, I would say. Um, in other parties, it's different. I would say in the left-wing parties, when you're young, it's an advantage. You don't have to show your, your track record because they think that you need uh, more and more young people and mm -hmm. it, it's, it's also okay if they don't have a track. So I don't want to say that one model is right or wrong. There are advantages for, for both models. But being in a, in a right or center-right party, I, I would say it's, it's harder. But when you have the track, they trust you, they give you responsibility, and then you can um, really like run for, for everything. Mm -hmm. And do you think that this is similar for the startup business? For example, if you're looking for money, most investors prefer to have any track record or any you know, senior experience before they actually want to give you money. Is this a similar situation there from your perspective, although you have not raised any money yourself yet? Yeah, they're... they're there is a similar, it's, it's similar to, to the youth politics, but as a startup, you're not so dependent. So if you have a great idea and great people and you have family and friends that can support you uh, with, with money or so, you can start it and then you can have the proof of concept really early if it's a really great idea. In politics, when you start, you're dependent on the president of the local chapter, you're dependent of the party members, if they like you or not. So there are many dependencies. Mm -hmm. So it, it makes it much more complicated, I would say. And this is what most of the people don't see, what happens within the party. Right. Like all these board meetings, all those meetings with the members, the discussions, when like, it, 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 it's huge. You, the people on the street, they just see like the president of the party speaking out on television or on the street. And, but what happens behind until you have those positions, it's, it's crazy. It's incredible. It's not really efficient, but it's democratic. So it's, we need the, this way of, um, of finding an, uh, a common point. Mm -hmm. but in, in, so there's many dependencies. And in startups, I would say that you are less dependent on others. You're just dependent on your idea and your thoughts and your, your power. Yeah, and you can always execute and, and build a profitable business, so you don't need any external yes, financing. Yes, yes, that's it. But I mean, when we started our, our own company, we had first uh, pop-up for four months. Mm -hmm. So we had a guy um, who owns several restaurants in Zurich, and I knew him from politics. So I was asking him, hey, can you help us out? And then he was like, I cannot help you with the concept because it's I'm not in favor of Asian fusion kitchen, mm -hmm. but I, I can give you a store for three months. You can try it out. So we were also kind of dependent on, on his help. Right. So when you start something, you have, yeah, the network is growing and the dependencies as well. But it's uh, also another guy could have helped us. So, but in the party, sometimes you really need like the, the gatekeepers to help you to go one step further. Yeah, I can imagine. The last question that we have for you today from the community is, what are your strengths? How would you describe them? <laughs> I would say I can uh, bring people together to make great things. 
So this is what I've been doing in politics for eight years, being a party president with 4,000 members. The only thing I need to know is um, who is good in what mm -hmm. and with whom I have to combine those skills to make it big. Um, being a co-founder of a company, uh, a banker founding a restaurant is kind of like, it's, it sounds like a joke, right? But um, we were able to be profitable in the third year now. And I was able to bring the right co-founders together and have a, uh, a really good team, now a good advisory board, and use also my network for, for getting new stores, locations. And mm -hmm. I think this is something I'm really good in it because I'm... Yeah, I'm, I'm, I just say I'm, I'm, I'm really like a normal guy in this world. And I don't think I'm something better because I'm in politics or because I did this and this. And um, having those two feet on the ground helps you a lot in life. Um, also in, in Switzerland, because uh, what people don't like is when, when you think you, you're something better than others. And having this um, ability is helps you with connecting people together. I think that's a wonderful life philosophy to close this episode. Thank you so much, Andre, for taking the questions of our community. And we wish you lots of success with the upcoming uh, elections and, of course, also with the expansion of your business. Thank you so much for having me. Next week, we will leave Zurich and travel to St. Gallen to meet with Andreas Fischler, the former CEO at Frontify. We'll be talking about how to get involved in a startup despite having a family and two kids, how to close your first big B2B clients, and why operating in Switzerland and especially in St. Gallen is an advantage for your company. Make sure to tune in again for an all new episode of the Swisspreneur Show next week. And if you enjoyed today's content, we would highly appreciate it if you left a rating on Apple Podcasts within the next seven days. Thank you so much.